Hello and welcome back to another video where we will be discussing some best practice tips that I have for you guys. Um, today our best practice tips are not going to be so much analytical, but they're going to be focused specifically on logging. All right, logging is not exactly the sexy thing that anyone, when they hear about it, um, probably are like, yeah, that's what I want to do with my life, you know. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people want to focus on machine learning, a lot of people want to focus on the analytics, because that's honestly where all the cool stuff is, let's be honest, it is. You know, it's where the uh, right the sexiest uh, job of the 21st century is not uh, being a data engineer or a logging type person that's interested in logging data. Um, it's being a data scientist. And this almost seems like it has nothing to do with data science. But it's a super important thing. Logging your procedures and ETLs is a key step into making sure you have systems that are maintainable, robust, um, and are really easy to fix and improve. I'm gonna say like improving is a huge thing. Having logging tables has made me, uh, or been, has given me the capability in multiple instances to save you know, anywhere from 30 to 70% of, of, of runtime because I knew where the problems were. You know, if you've got a query that takes a day to run and you're waiting for a day just to figure out where a problem is or you're waiting you know, just for one section of code to run and it takes three hours, okay, well maybe that was the problem. And, you know, you're trying to find the biggest, the biggest uh, gap and the biggest uh, kind of hog of, of time, it's gonna be really hard without logging. And the, the hard thing with logging, I think, is, you know, you don't see the, the results right away. You know, it takes time. You have, to, you have to be disciplined and always remember to build a table. So with that, let's talk about some very basic concepts that we have to do when we create these tables. So typically, you'll have, you know, maybe one or two tables based on logging. It really depends on the size of the company you work at. You know, if you work for a large company, you, your systems, you probably have like a wrapper that like, again, wraps around everything and logs every little thing that happens in your ETLs and then is analyzed later because ETLs are such a big portion, right? Like, can you imagine the amount of ETLs that occur at Amazon? They probably have, you know, hundreds and thousands, tens of thousands, honestly, of servers that run ETLs alone. Um, and it, it's super expensive. And so tracking all that and doing analytics on that is very important. Now, if you work for a small company that has, you know, maybe four products, you, you don't need crazy amounts of logging. And we're just gonna talk about the, you don't need crazy amounts of logging um, example, because you probably only need two or three tables. And it might be central and it might be application specific. Again, this is, these are all design things that you have to think about. Like, how do you wanna support the system? So, at the very basic level, you need uh, what I would say at least two tables. Again, very basic, nothing, nothing fancy here. One table is purely for your ETL, so the ETL itself, um, because you're gonna have tasks or store procedures or jobs, whatever you call them, in that ETL, but the ETL is kind of this high level you know, thing. And you'll have, it'll basically create an ETL ID, um, that way you can track it, and that ETL ID will basically be located or connected with a system ID of some kind, unless again, you're doing a system specific um, logging, then you don't need this system ID because each system, you know where it goes because it's in the system itself. But if it's not system specific and it is a central system, you know, that's tracking, you know, your four applications that have ETLs with them or your four dashboards that have ETLs with them, well, you should probably either have something, something that represents, you know, which one of those things it's going to because otherwise, how are you gonna know where it's going to without having to you know, look up the tasks, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, source ID, I'm really referencing this as a file, um, but it could also be if you really wanna be super intricate and, and go into the level of, hey, these are these tables or something that, that's a little complex, but if you wanna go into tables, that's fine, um, that's on you. Uh, you need to at least track files that get uh, inserted on ETLs. Um, and I use source ID because again, it's just more abstract in case you, you do want to focus on more than files, but at the very least you need to say, well, where did, if there's files, where are they coming from? Because you could have thousands of files and the last thing you, if you, do, if you can't tell where this ETL is coming from, you're going to have a really hard time. I'm just, I'm just saying like, if you don't know where something went wrong and which file and you're just auto, have this automated system that's chucking in files and then suddenly it breaks and you don't know why, um, which file? I don't know. You have a thousand of them. Figure it out. You know. So having a source ID, um, and you might be like, "Well, what's the source ID attached to?" Well, I didn't add a file table, but you should have a file table that has a file ID that you can track back. Um, so 
Imagine you have a file table that has the file location. We've talked about that before. You know, it's got the file location, it's got the file name, file ID, probably file type, whatever, things like of that nature. So you can tie this back. And I'm assuming that exists. So that's what this ties to. Source type, again, if you want to be specific about tables or something of that nature. Sorry. Um, next, again, we were talking about performance. So this is where start time and end time kind of come in. Um, you want to track that, obviously, say like, hey, did this ETL run worse or, or, or better? Um, again, if you work for a larger company, you're going to be tracking outliers of the same ETL types. Um, you know, if you've got this ETL that's been running for three years and then suddenly it goes from taking two hours to taking uh, eight, you should probably check that out kind of thing. Or even if it goes from two hours to four, like that's probably something you should look into. Um, and then there's probably some people out there who think I'm egregious for putting in pre-aggregated data. Um, and I totally get it. But if you're in a small company, um, you don't need to be that specific and worry about granularity for logging. Obviously for analytics and actual data, yes. But if you're, if you're managing, again, four products, just pre, just pre aggregate your data at this level, it saves you time. Um, and there's no point in aggregating it later personally. But again, if you're super anal, do it. I get it. I understand you, you like granularity. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, basically the fact that I've got start and end time, that's already enough information to create these two portions of data here. And there's a transformation that occurs here, right? Like I have to do the math to calculate this number of these two numbers below. And so some people would, would probably be upset that I put this um, at this level and they'd rather it be in a separate table or when you're analyzing it, you should just do it then. But again, to me, if, if you're just supporting four, four products or four dashboards, it's overkill personally. Like I try to think about, you know, where are things going? And again, that's a design decision. You have to make those yourself. You have to think about what's, what's worth to you, what's not worth to you. And then error flag just is kind of, you know, flag if something went wrong or not at this level. But this is high level, right? Like this is the ETL itself. But in each ETL, you probably have 20 or 30 store procedures, jobs, tasks, however you're gonna call them. Um, and that's where you're gonna have your kind of task level information. And you don't have to, again, it's not super descriptive here. You don't have to be. What you want to say, you know, is just in this ETL task. Uh, you can say ETL task name if you want, by the way, if you'd be more specific. But ETL task, just say, like, you know, what's the store procedure that it is? You know, maybe USP update uh, metric, USP insert transact or F transactions. Like, just take the store procedure name and insert it into this description or this ETL task field. That's all you have to do because what you're trying to do is say, where did the problem happen? You know, you're going to track errors, right? With this error, oh, error message actually. And you want to know where things went wrong. And you don't have to be super fancy. You want to know what the error message was. That's very important. So you don't have to run it again. And again, this is all about saving time. You don't have to run it again. You want to know what the problem was. You want to know where it came from. So, Again, you're gonna have this error message. It's gonna tie, tie back to a file if it was a file and you're gonna tie it to tasks. So you know all of this information. You know, hey, the error happened here. It was a, you know, you ran out of space. You know, it was bar chart 100. It was 120 characters um, and it came from, you know, file 100 and that file is whatever. So it just saves you time. You don't have to rerun it, right? Like you don't have to find that file ID, rerun it, see what the error message was manually. Again, this is all about developing systems that are quote unquote automated. And, and automated really in this case just means requires very little human intervention at all. You know, at all. It probably won't fix itself. It's probably not that smart. We'll, we'll get there at some point, but really files still come in with problems. Files still come in with inconsistencies, but they only come in hopefully one every thousand files. And hopefully you can automate your system for those 999 um, and these, you know, you have no problems, but when you have an error finally come up and you get in this error message, it's there. You can find it, you can track it. Again, this is where I found those divide by zero errors that we've talked about before in best practices. It's this error message. Hey, you have a divide by zero error in this metric that you've developed. Oh, okay, I, I know what that is. I know what the problem is and I already know where to go fix it, right? And it just saves a bunch of time. It's about, again, it's saving time. It's improving performance. Uh, I talked about it before. Like if you know that, hey, task, you know, USP update metric takes, 10 hours well that's ridiculous like how do we fix that how do we improve that then you can look at okay well there's you know however many queries in there well let's break it down query by query 
Uh, let's look for where the longest time is. Do we, need to add an, do we need to add an index? Do we need to break down the data more? Do we have enough where statements? Are we using a small enough population? But you can't know where those problems are if you don't have good logging. And I know this seems like I'm ranting, but it, it, it's just one of those things that, you know, I wish someone would have told me when I was a younger engineer, you know, I just built a bunch of uh, ETLs. No one told me about logging. I just built them. And then, you know, as things go wrong, you like think you're supposed to just run the system, uh, you know, run the SSIS package and see where the error came up on this file. But, you know, if you really want to be automated and you really want to start thinking about, you know, taking your stuff to the next level, building simple ETL tables and log tables don't take much time and they really help out. Um, and I don't know, maybe some of you are, are smart enough and think about it uh, on your own. But if you're like me and we're just straight out of college and didn't have any mentor of any kind who showed you, hey, you should set up this table, well, hopefully this helps you out. I'm really hoping that you know, this, this reaches those people who didn't have anyone to help them out uh, or are looking for someone to help them out. And with that, you know, I'm gonna kind of close this video and, and kind of add in like, hey, if you're someone who's looking to improve their best practices, if you're someone who's out of college, if you're someone who just wants to get better in general SQL or, or data engineering, you know, please feel free to reach out, comment, subscribe, whatever it takes to get us to notice, um, you know, and, and leave some questions, leave some comments. Like we'd be happy to help you improve. You know, uh, I love giving back. I love the opportunity to teach. So if you have a problem, if you need uh, some help, feel free to reach out uh, and we'll do our best to get back to you as soon as we can. And thank you so much for taking your time to watch this video. I know there's like hundreds of videos you could be watching right now. So thank you so much for, for spending time with us and let me know how I can improve uh, your work today. Uh, thank you.